Thank you so much. In 1980, Phyllis and I and our youngest, our oldest daughter, she was our only daughter at that time, we moved to Colorado and uh, Leadville, Colorado is a unique place. They get a little over 12 feet of snowfall every year. Uh, interesting for a country boy from Chilton County. And I asked somebody when we moved there, I said, how long does the, the winter last here? And I was told that there was uh, 10 months of winter and two months of heavy sledding. Uh, and that was, uh, that was just about right. But uh, of course in Alabama, uh, and we're experiencing this right now, you know we have four seasons here. Uh, it's fixing to be summer, summer, still summer, and Christmas. <laughs> but uh, if, you, if you ask knowledgeable children about the four seasons, it'd be like the little girl who said, well, I, I know, I, you know how kids, when, when they know the answer, they just jump up and down. You can see the excitement on there. Pick me, pick me, pick me. Uh, teacher called on her and give me the four seasons. She says, well, I know three of them. There's, there's dove season, deer season, and turkey season. And I can't remember the other one. But uh, we, we understand. But wait a minute. And you, if I started out talking about seasons, I'd eventually have to go here. Because everybody in Alabama knows that if we're talking about fixing the be, y'all do understand that terminology, right? Uh, if we're talking about fixing the be, it's fixing the be football season. <laughs> y'all know that's, that's pretty important in the state of Alabama. Now, I gotta ask you, gotta ask you, and I do want to see your hands. How many of you have ever hollered at a football game to, or watching one on TV till you couldn't talk the next day? See? That's, now that's what I'm talking about. You just put it all, all in there. You, you're all in 100%, and, and you know, the end of the game, you're just exhausted. Just, I mean, worn completely out. Because you, I mean, you've laid it all down. And listen, we, we know, or at least you know here in Hewitt, uh, because you had a state championship football team last year. Some of y'all hollered at those games, didn't you? Uh, to, to points of exhaustion because you were putting your whole heart into it, right? And might I say that uh, the young men who were a part of that football team, they put their whole heart into it. Uh, it was something bigger than the individual. It was something that everybody was, was committed to. So, so you as, as parents and fans, you were exhausted because you'd been right there with them, cheering them on and, and forced the next day. The young men were exhausted because they had put it all on the line. They gave it everything that they had. Why is it then? If we understand the concept of wholeheartedness, why is it that we don't do that for our Savior? Why is it that, that we don't worship Him to the point of exhaustion when we come together? Now, I, I know that, that we all want that God should receive our very best. Everybody? We should give Him a thank you for that song. It is the blood of Jesus that washed away my sin. Something that I can never repay Him for. But shouldn't I and shouldn't you in our appreciation for His miraculous gift, shouldn't we give Him everything that we have? Shouldn't we put our whole heart into worship, into service, into every aspect of our Christian life. Doesn't He deserve that? Isn't He worthy? In the book of Psalms, chapter 9, the concept of wholehearted service to God uh, really is found quite often in the book of Psalms. It's not the only place. Uh, but it's, it's found quite, uh, quite often there. And I want us to consider this morning what, uh, what being wholehearted for God involves. Psalm 9, verse 1. I will 
Praise Thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all Thy marvelous works. Let's pray. Father, each one of us in this place this morning look at our own lives and, and realize how blessed we have been. Lord, for the help that we have to be able to come to this place to worship you. We recognize that as your gift to us. For your sweet spirit in this place, as promised, we recognize that as a gift to Father, in the remainder of this service, be glorified. And may each one of us look at our own lives. And just simply ask that question. If we are giving our whole hearts to you, speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. I want you to know something. If, uh, if my wife thought for a second that I did not love her with my whole heart, she wouldn't put up with that. And she shouldn't. Uh, because she ought to be able to know that, uh, that in our relationship, I'm, I'm giving to her uh, all that I can give as a husband, as, as, a, as a part of that family. We, we need to give our whole hearts to, to our spouses, to our children. Some of you say, well, preacher, don't leave out grandchildren. Y'all, uh, anybody in here giving their whole heart to their grandchildren? Y'all don't like them. Uh, we, we understand that concept. Wholeheartedness. We get it. We know what that means. It's being sold out. It's giving everything that we have and holding nothing back. Uh, that is how our relationship with our Heavenly Father ought to be. We ought to give Him everything that we have, holding nothing back. Uh, the psalmist said, I will praise Thee, O Lord. Why shouldn't we praise Him? I will praise Thee with my whole heart. That's everything that He had. I will praise Thee with my whole heart. Can you think of anyone more deserving of our praise this morning? than is <coughs> I will praise thee with my whole heart. So with that thought in mind, let's talk for just a moment. Wholehearted worship. Now I know that there are times that everybody feels bad. And I know that, uh, and I admire you because some of you show up to church when you feel less than 100%. I've done it myself. Been there, done that. But that does not mean that uh, we shouldn't give Him everything that we have, even if we don't feel good. I used to marvel. There was a, there was a lady in the church in Selma, and she had gotten very old, and she had <coughs> raised a house full of children by herself because her husband uh, died young. And uh, she, was, she was bent over from uh, osteoarthritis, she had a host of health problems, uh, and yet she made it to church. She came. She was faithful. She got there. And I know in my heart that she didn't feel like it. I know that. And it, it would have been easy for her to say, well, you know, I just, I just don't feel like going today. I'm just going to stay home. And I reminded the, the younger people in the sanctuary uh, one day when she was not there because she wouldn't have had me call attention to her for anything in the world. But I reminded the young people that that ought to convict their hearts when they wake up on Sunday morning. You know, I'm just too tired to go today. I just don't feel like it. They ought to look at her and recognize that somebody is putting their own heart. Somebody is giving back to the Lord all that they have. I believe if we worship with our whole hearts, it affects our attitude. 
I believe it affects our behavior. I believe that it affects our witness, how we relate to other people in our relationship with God. Putting your whole heart into it. Listen, if we can do it for football, surely, surely, we can do it for our Savior. Surely, we can do it for Him. I would praise Him for His marvelous works. I would praise Him for everlasting life. I would praise Him for the gift of His Son. I would praise Him for the peace of God that passes understanding. He is worthy to receive our praise. And I believe that if we would stop and just consider Everything that He has done for us, we would praise Him more. Perhaps then we would praise Him with our whole hearts. In the book of Psalm chapter 111, and, and we're going to read mostly from Psalms, especially from uh, chapter 119, but Psalm 111 verse 1, Praise ye the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright. And in the congregation. You don't think God intends for us to come together and worship corporately? I believe He does. I believe that the book of Hebrews teaches us that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. If you are a part of this body, why would you want to withhold that fellowship, withhold that encouragement from the rest of us? We need you. We need you to be a part of that. We need to praise God with all that we have. Uh, being wholehearted in worship, I believe it inspires others to be wholehearted in worship. I believe it makes a difference in how we approach Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And I believe that we have all seen folks over the years and, and this, please don't misunderstand, this is not to be considered judgmental. But you see people who, uh, who have come into church and maybe not really been wholehearted in their worship of God. Just hold them back a little bit. The book of Psalm 138, you turn with me there, 138, verse 1. I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing unto thee. Singing praises unto thee, one true and living God. Before all of the other false gods of this world, we should sing praises unto the one who is the true and living God. Anybody in here ever been tempted to sing? Yeah, y'all know what I'm talking about. Temptation is always there. It's always before us. Here's something to try. Next time you are tempted to sin, stop in your tracks and sing praises to Almighty God. Guarantee that will make a difference in your actions over the next few minutes. If you do that, with your whole heart. So yes, wholehearted worship is a part of the picture, but I would be remiss as your pastor if I let it go with wholehearted worship. There needs to be a wholehearted obedience to God. See, that's that's the thing that's missing in a lot of people's lives. We can get that coming to know Jesus as our Savior thing. We, we can get that. Uh, we, can, we can follow the Lord in believers' baptism. We get that. But it's that... It's that obedience to the Word of God that hinders us. There is a whole life of spirituality that many people are missing because they are failing in their obedience to the Word of God. Don't let that person be you. Enjoy the fullness of the living God in your life by practicing a wholehearted obedience. Uh, if you would look with me to Psalm... 119, Psalm 119, verse 34. The 
The psalmist says, Give me understanding and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Mm. When's the best time to be obedient to God? Can anybody say, right now? Right now is that time that you have. Uh, you do not have yesterday. Tomorrow is not yours yet. The best time to practice a wholehearted obedience to God is right this very instance. And, and recognizing the importance of God's Word is a part of that. Recognizing how important it is to read, to, to meditate upon, and to gain a spiritual understanding of God's Word. Uh, and listen, there's a difference between obeying out of fear and obeying out of love. That makes all the difference in the world. We ought to practice that, that heart of love. Practice wholehearted obedience to God just because He loves us. In verse 69 of that same chapter, The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. When you are being obedient to God, and you know you are following God's Word, let me just say to you, it doesn't matter what other people say. It matters what you know in your heart is right. It matters what you understand from God's Word is the pressing issue. It matters that you practice a wholehearted obedience to God. In verse 145 of that same chapter, I cried with my whole heart, Hear me, O Lord, I will keep thy statutes. Sometimes in my life and in your life, we may find the things that God says, the things that God commands. We may find them a little hard for us to, to put into practice because it goes against what the flesh wants to believe. It goes against what the flesh wants to practice. So we, we find that a little bit difficult. Let me say to you, out loud, under your breath, in your mind, however you need to do it when you get to that point, just cry out to God, Lord, I need your help. I need your help. But I'm going to be obedient to you with my whole heart. I can't do it by myself. But I'm going to be obedient to you with my whole heart. Wholehearted worship, wholehearted obedience, wholehearted seeking, seeking God. Uh, I believe the more you fall in love with God, the more you want to know about God. I believe the more you see Him at work in your life, the more you want to know about His workings in your life. I believe that we need to seek God with our whole heart. In uh, Psalm 119, 119 and verse 2, at the back up there, Blessed are they that keep His testimonies and that seek Him with the whole heart. What keeps us from seeking God with our whole heart. The part of it is stubbornness, I believe. Uh, part of it is a willfulness on our part. But once we get to that point where we recognize and realize that God is at work in our life and we really, really want to seek Him, we find a willingness to follow what God is speaking to our hearts. We find a willingness to meditate upon His promises so that they're no longer just the promises that are in the Bible, no longer just the promises to people that you know that are super spiritual. They become your promises 
when you make them your own. It's God's promise to you through His love. Uh, we want to read that word. We want to abide in Christ. We want to be obedient to Him. We want to pray. We want to seek Him more and more. In 1975, when Phyllis and I were dating, I know y'all, that's a long time ago, uh, and like you, I can't understand how she's put up with me all these years, but uh, when we were dating, it was 105 miles from my house to her house. Now, that was a pretty good trip. That was... Uh, a 210 mile round trip for me to come and see my girlfriend, then my fiance, my soon to be wife. Do you know what? It was never a long trip. Because the destination was worth the sacrifice. Our relationship with God ought to be so much greater than that. The destination, being in His presence, being wrapped up in the love of His Spirit, it's worth whatever we go through to get there. Whatever His Word requires of us to be there, it is worth every moment of that seeking that we've gone through. In verse 10 of 119, with my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. God's word is still important. Uh, verse 58. I entreated thy favor with my whole heart. Be merciful unto me according to thy word. Now, I want to bounce over into the New Testament. The book of Galatians. Seeking God's favor, seeking, seeking more of God with our whole heart is going to absolutely change our relationship with other people. Uh, in verse 10 of chapter 1, the book of Galatians, the apostle Paul says, For do, now, uh, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ over into the book of Jeremiah chapter 29 verses 12 through the first part of verse 14 then shall you call upon me you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you and you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord. Wholehearted worship, wholehearted obedience, wholehearted seeking. Finally, there is a wholehearted repentance. I know that there is a uh, very popular theology that's going around today uh, that says that uh, all of our sins have been covered in the blood of Christ and, and the repentance is no longer something that we need to practice. Hogwash. Paul knew it himself. He recognized a sinfulness within himself so that he often went to God in repentance. Uh, in, in the book of uh, 1 John, what does it say? If I confess my sins, He's faithful and just to forgive my sins and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Yes, my sins are covered in the blood of Christ. There's a story that, that Jesus told one of his parables, and it was about uh, a wayward son. And it was about that son asking for his inheritance, and, and the father gave it to him, and he watched the son go away. And he grieved for him the whole time that he was gone. 
And that father's heart cried out because he wanted to see that son. But that son had separated himself from the father. Uh, you read that, uh, that account and one day that, that son had, a, had one of those moments where he recognized that what the servants in my father's house are better off than I am. I'll go to my father and I'll say, Father, I've sinned before God and in your sight I'm no longer worthy to be counted of your, as your son. Make me as one of your servants. And you know the story. The son comes and, and, and the father sees him a long way off headed back that way. And the father rushes out to meet him and in humility the son bows his head and he says what he had purposed in his heart to say, I'm no longer Y'all remember what the Bible says. Father wrapped his arms around him. Welcome him back. Yes, I believe that repentance is one of those things we ought to practice in our lives. When I cut myself off, and that fellowship relationship because of actions in my life. Fellowship, there's a difference between uh, my standing with God and, and, and where I'm standing on my own. I'm secure in Christ. I've never doubted that for a moment. But I know that I can do things that are offensive to my Heavenly Father. I know that. If you're honest, you know that. Uh, anybody in here, your children ever disappoint you? You know what? Even when they disappointed you, they were still your children. And all you wanted was for them to make things right. Our God loves us more than we can find them. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 24, verse 7. And look, I know this, this promise was originally given to Israel, but it helps us to focus on this one fact that any time a person comes to Christ, any time a person in genuine repentance comes and acknowledges that sin before God, there's a place of restoration. I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. True repentance. That doesn't mean I'm sorry I was caught. True repentance is a whole heart return to God. And listen, I believe true repentance is a precursor to true revival. Because I don't believe you're going to have true revival until there is true repentance in the heart. Here's the thing. This is where we are. And you'll recognize this. We come before God and we say, I want to wholeheartedly worship you, but, but, I, I want to be wholeheartedly obedient to you, but fill in the blank, folks. I want to wholeheartedly seek you, but I want to wholeheartedly repent, but what is the but in your life? That's keeping you from being the individual that you know God wants you to be. Listen, I'm, I'm not your judge. I'm not the jury either. Because I'm simply not the guy. But I believe each one of us are supposed to judge our own lives. And I want you to judge your own life up against the Word of God. I want you to judge your life up against what you know God's Word has commanded us to do. 
very soon. On Saturdays, the screens will fill the stadium. That's not our God. 